we are flirting with climate disaster. Every week brings a new climate horror story. Greenhouse gas emissions are at record levels and growing. The commitment to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees is nearly going up in smoke. Without further action, we are headed to a 2.8 degree increase. And the consequences, as we all know, would be devastating. Several parts of our planet would be uninhabitable, and for many, it will mean a death sentence. But this is not a surprise. The science has been clear for decades. And I'm not talking only about uh, UN scientists. I'm talking even about fossil fuel scientists. We learned last week that certain fossil fuel producers were fully aware in the 70s that their core product was baking our planet. And just like the tobacco industry, they rode roughshod over their own science. Some in big oil peddled the big lie. And like the tobacco industry, those responsible must be held to account. Today, fossil fuel producers and their enablers are still racing to expand production, knowing full well that this business model is inconsistent with human survival. Now, this insanity belongs in science fiction, yet we know the ecosystem meltdown is cold, hard scientific fact. Bridging divides and restoring trust means meaningful climate action, and climate action now. The battle to keep the 1.5 degree limit alive will be won or lost in these decades, on our watch. And uh, right now, we have to confess that the battle is being lost. So we need to act together to close the emissions gap. And that means to phase out progressively coal, and supercharge the renewable revolution, to end the addiction to fossil fuels, and to stop our self-defeating war on nature. On the other hand, the developed world must finally deliver on its 100 billion climate finance commitment to support developing countries. Adaptation finance must be doubled, as it was promised in Sharm El Sheikh. And the biggest emitters, namely the G20 countries, must unite around the Climate Solidarity Pact in which they make extra efforts in the 2020s to keep the 1.5 degree limit alive. And it doesn't work if developed countries attribute responsibility to emerging economies and the emerging economies attribute responsibility to developed countries. They need to come together to bring together all their capacities, financial and technological, with the, the developed ones providing financial and technical assistance to help the major emerging economies to accelerate their renewable energy transition. Because if they don't, we will not be able to reduce emissions at the level that is necessary to keep the 1.5 degree goal, I would say to keep the 2 degree goal alive. And our climate goals need the full engagement of the private sector. Now, the truth is that more and more businesses are making net zero commitments, but benchmarks and criteria are often dubious or murky. And this can mislead consumers, investors and regulators with false narratives. And it feeds a culture of climate misinformation and confusion and leaves the door open to greenwashing. That's why we created an expert group on net zero emissions commitments recently the group has issued a how to guide for credible, accountable net zero pledges. And here in, at Davos, I call on all corporate leaders to act based on these guidelines. To put forward credible and transparent transition plans on how to achieve net zero and to submit those plans before the end of the year. Now, the transition to net zero must be grounded in real emissions cuts and not relying essentially on carbon credits or shadow markets. So, Excellencies and dear friends, there are no perfect solutions in a perfect storm. But we can work to control the damage 
and to seize the opportunities available. And now more than ever, it's time to forge the best ways to cooperation in our fragmented world, to adopt multilateral solutions, to bring trust to where trust is badly needed because the world cannot wait. And I thank you for your patience.